Hello, my name is Robin Chodak and I am your grief, life, and spiritual coach. I am posting an interview for you that I just did with Andrea Ribmeyer on the radio station called News for the Soul. It's discussing grief and my latest book called Three Must Have Connections for Inner Peace. I believe we are all looking for some inner peace. So please stay tuned and share this with your friends. Bye for now. I'd like to introduce you to Robin. I met Robin actually through Transformation TV. We both uh, did that together, and she wrote a book. And I also, Robin's interviewed me in the past, and I also met Robin in Zurich when we were doing the movie for Transformation TV. So I'm just going to read you a little bio of Robin, just so we really um, kind of place where we're going today. And uh, just Robin's had a, a very full life in all forms. So Robin knows how important inner peace is for survival. After suffering the loss and tragedy, many losses and tragedy in her life, at 28, she lost her 20-year-old sister to cancer. She lost her husband to suicide in 2005. She left her job as a computer system analyst and began helping others uh, with suicide loss. She became certified as a grief, life, and spiritual coach, a Reiki practitioner, NLP, which is Neuro Linguistic Programming Practitioner, and Mindfulness Meditation Teacher. That's a lot of, lot of, of uh, studying and work there. These are all contributing now to her personal transformation. And in 2019, she experienced another loss. Her husband, Dr. Gerald Shodak, died unexpectedly in their home. And it moved her to publish this book, this recent book, that her third book, that was written three years prior to his death. She understands that without the three connections, I'm very excited to hear about this, she will be describing in, about her book. So it's the three must-have connections for inner peace. And if she hadn't done this, uh, we'll hear from her. She said she probably wouldn't have survived. If you are suffering from grief or any difficulty, in any difficult situation, then this book is a must read for you. And in these times of 2020, grief is paramount. Robin's desire is that you will find the same inner peace that she has found. She also wrote two other books. We'll talk about that at the end um, when we do a little promotion and uh, so that you can connect with Robin, also get her books and uh, maybe work with her. So I'd like to bring Robin in. Hello, Andrea. Hi, Robin. Hi. Thank you so much. That's a lot. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you so much for coming on. Um, we were just, Robin and I were talking just before the show a few days ago. And just, News for the Soul is a very special energy. Uh, I kept thinking, what am I going to do for my next show? And I kept getting the word grief. And so I thought, well, okay. And I, I really like having the people who know about these subjects come on to my show. And I thought, who knows, who does grief? And I'm like, oh, my God, Robin. And so, and Robin told me, she put out to the universe, it's time for me to do my work again. It's time. So uh, this is the time today uh, for Robin to share where she's at, what she's doing, and her beautiful work. So I'm going to just leave it up to you, Robin. Okay, uh, just let it flow however you like. All right. Yes. Yes, absolutely, Andrea. Thank you so much, and I want to thank all my friends and followers and family who are tuning in right now. And most importantly, I want to say to anyone right now who is suffering from a loss that. I'm very, very sorry for what you are experiencing in this moment. 
these these difficult times that we are all going through, and especially if you have had a recent loss from COVID, someone you knew, or from suicide or any tragedy, this is very difficult. But what I want to say to you is that it does transform and it does change over time. Your grief, your grief will cause change. And we'll get into that in, in a minute. But what I'd like to tell you is how this book came about, this three must-have connections for inner peace. And as Andrea has said, I've had a lot of loss in my life. And I experienced the dark night of the soul. Many people have experienced that. Many writers have written about that. C.S. Lewis wrote the book after his wife had died called A Grief Observed. And when we have these tragedies and traumas in our life, it causes us to look at things differently. We look at all our beliefs that we have carried throughout our entire lives. These beliefs get formed, you know, by the age of eight, they say. Those are our formative years. And as we go through our lives, these belief systems serve us. They serve us because everything is just going just the way we want it. But it isn't until something happens, a tragedy, a trauma, something that comes into our lives that causes us to, to examine those beliefs. And what happened to me is when my husband Steve died by suicide in 2005, that's when I had to examine my beliefs. I was taught, brought up, had this idea in my mind that if people died by suicide, they were going to this place called hell. They weren't going to this place that people refer to as heaven. Well, when Steve died, I really, really wrestled with that idea, and I just... I could no longer embrace that belief any longer. And then I began to examine many of my beliefs. And it's those beliefs that we have held that keep us stuck. And I realized I didn't want to be in a stuck state. So it took a lot of work and a lot of a lot of uh, what I call inner work. And I'll, uh, that is one of the things I'll talk about in my book. But I want to go back to how this book, my third book, came to be. As Andrea said, my husband died, my, my current husband Jerry died unexpectedly in my home. And we had created such a wonderful, beautiful life together we were both extremely happy. He was a doctor. He was very healthy. He was living his life to the fullest in his retirement years. And we had a beautiful day that day. I woke up 4.30 in the morning. He wasn't in the bed. And I called out to him. I went to the couch, and there he was. He had died sometime in the night. So that was a shock. It wasn't anything that I had ever expected to happen. Are you there, Andrea? I'm here. Okay, great, great. It's so silent out there. <laughs> it's, I know, it's I know, I know, I know. I actually put myself on mute because I, I really want to give you space around this. So, oh. um, yeah, yeah. No, you were here. Okay. <laughs> Oh, that's good. No, I just, it was so silent, and I, I thought, I hear I'm wondering, you. These, these vibrations are going out into the universe. It's okay. It's silent. <laughs> so Yeah. No, to, and this work is super important. Uh, again, okay, so, I, Robin, I just want to acknowledge you just um, for, for your loss, your recent loss, and yes. uh, for the courage, because really this work does take courage. Um, to come to write the book and to come online to to come on to News for the Soul Heart Healer 
um, to speak about your experience. Thank you, and um, we really we're really very grateful. Thank you. Yes, and, and and speaking about you know courage, it does take courage to 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 survive. It takes courage to want to continue on. It takes courage to process your grief. It does take courage. And to continue to continue on with my story, so I found my beloved Jerry dead, and I went into a state of shock. Of course, you, whenever you have trauma or tragedy, anything you don't expect, it, it, it brings the shock factor to your whole, not only to your, your, your mind, to actually your physical body. And that's why we, we either, you know, we have these emotions within us. We feel like we're going to pass out or we feel like we're going to vomit or whatever it is. Our body is also responding to the, the shock of, of the heartbreak of our heart and our, our soul, it, feel, it felt as if my soul had just been severed and cut in two mm-hmm. because of this loss, because you have such a, 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 an extreme connection with someone. And, and so that happened, and I had to go through the steps of processing my grief, which I know all too well, and I... I at some point, I said to myself, oh, am I, am I really a grief coach? <laughs> because you, you get to this place where you think, wow, I, 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 I'm able to help people, but why in this moment I'm not able to help myself? And that is when I recognized, yes, I am in a state of shock. And, and then I did recognize, yes, I do need to seek help. And that is one of the steps that I always say to my clients, there's three things that you need to do. You need to seek help, you need to receive love, and you need to begin to learn how to trust yourself. So I was able to reach out to some of my grief colleagues, and they were just wonderful, and they helped me along my journey, as well as other things. So... I, yeah, I, I, I'd like to. I, I'd like to put in. I have this quote um, from. You might know it, Earl Grohman. I don't know if you know him. It's just like grief. I want to do this quote because grief is not a disorder, a disease, or a sign of weakness. It is an emotional, physical, and spiritual necessity. It's the price you pay for love, and the only cure for grief is to grieve. Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. That's beautiful. It's absolutely beautiful. And every experience we have is, is different. And, mm-hmm. and it doesn't, just because you are an expert or, or you have studied something in your life or you've had prior experiences, it, it doesn't mean that everything is going to be the same. And everyone, I never want it. I don't even like the word expert because it sounds like you have all this knowledge. And, and I don't believe we have ever arrived or we, we have all of this knowledge because there's so much in the universe and we're constantly learning and we're constantly growing and evolving. Mm-hmm. And I like to say in my life right now, I'm an evolving soul living in this physical realm, experiencing moments of joy and moments of happiness. I mean, that's where I am right now. And I think that's where we all are. It's just recognition of living in this human form, but actually being, we are spiritual. So I I keep diverting. I want to get back to this book because it was so interesting that how it came about. I went after Jerry had passed. It was about six months later. And I was going through the processes of learning how to be alone, creating my new identity, mm-hmm. working through it, because we're always constantly creating new identities. So sometimes they're forced upon us, and sometimes we choose our identities. I talk about identity in the book. And I said, oh, I really need something right now. And because I learn, have learned how to listen to spirit, I... I <laughs> I listened, and it said, okay, go to your computer and look for this book you wrote three years ago. So I listened. I go to my computer. I find the book, and I open it. Well, I see on my computer that it was saved. It was saved 
on the evening after Jerry died. So I, I'm thinking that is that's just crazy. How I was huh. not in my book, editing my book, and hit the save button. I I was in a state of shock. Number one, and I had all these people in my house. So how did that book be saved on my computer? Well, to me, that is a sign. And there are many things that happen in the non-physical realm all the time around us. And we're just not tuned into them. And so, therefore, oftentimes, we just overlook these things that are happening because everything is a, a vibration. And if we begin to pay attention to them, we are, we are listening to, to spirits. And that was a sign because that was something that happened in the non-physical of my realm, okay? I did not go onto my computer and save that document. So that was a sign from Jerry. Jerry was my biggest supporter, my biggest cheerleader, and he had read that book three years prior. So now I believed that this was Jerry saying, you, you need to publish this book. So I opened the book on my computer. I sat there and I read it from cover to cover. I hit the save button. I hit the save button at exactly three, three, three. <laughs> and you know what I did? I, had, I have screen prints of both of these occurrences just because wow. I thought, well, if I ever want to prove, if somebody wants me to prove this, I actually have screen prints. Because these are things that happen in the non-physical. We live so caught up in the physical because we are human. But there's so much more happening around us. And as we begin to pay attention, we can get guided on what we need. And so that book being saved at 333 was my sign. You need to publish it now. And it was right around the time that COVID was beginning that I published mm -hmm. that book. And so many people were just in shock and in grief. And, and I remember hearing about the initial stages, and I said to myself, everyone is now living like me and people in grief. Because what happens when you're in shock and grief, you can't leave your house. Well, you, you physically can, but you're in an emotional state where oftentimes you don't want to leave your house. You're depressed. You can't get yourself out of bed. And here now the whole world is to being told to stay in their houses. <laughs> So it was quite interesting how it correlated with the experiences that I have had and others have had, and especially when they're very tragic, like suicide. And there's different, there's different types of grief, and there's something called anticipatory grief. That's when you know that your loved one is going to die, and so you... You have time, a little time to process it. Doesn't make it easier, but you you know it's coming. Okay, so and then with suicide, now that is considered a complicated grief because now you're adding layers to the normal grief process. Okay, there is they call it a normal process. That's because everyone is going to experience grief at some point in their life, and we all know that we are going to die. So we know that we're going to experience at some point the loss of somebody we love and go through normal grief. Well, we like to think it's normal when it's our grandmother at 98, right? I mean, for some mm -hmm. reason, our minds, they can accept that. But when it was suicide, my mind had a hard time wrapping my brain around why someone would want to end their lives. So that is yeah, considered a Yeah, and Robin, there's, I'm just going to, every once in a while I just I'll pipe in there and try to pipe in. I want to bring, just go back. Can you describe what, I know everyone has different meaning. What did you get from the three, the book is three, the book is called Three. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. connections. What is 333 to you? I just want to go back to that, and then I'm going to go back to the other pieces that you just talked about. 
So what what well, is I know what three three is, but I just thought the audience is some people aren't familiar with it. Yes, and and, and I, since Steve died in two thousand five, I was awakened to the vibration of numbers, and particularly the eleven eleven. It 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 was so profound when it came to me because my husband Steve was a musician and he loved the Beatles. And after he died, I couldn't listen to music, nor the Beatles. And one day, it came on the radio, and I didn't feel like turning it off. And I listened to the song, and when I looked on the clock, it said 1111. It didn't really resonate with me then, but guess what? It happened again. And again, it happened two more times with the Beatles song, but then every day... Every day since 2005, I have seen the number 1111 more than once, multiple times. Everything has guided my life by the 11. And I had married Steve not knowing about the power of numbers. I married him on 11-11-95. I married Jerry on 11-11-11. And that was oh, wow. deliberate. That was wow. a deliberate decision because he began to see the numbers eleven, eleven, two. So now we had this total synchronicity, and it was with I felt it was with Steve, it was with Jerry, and it was with myself, and it was the synchronicity of always seeing these numbers. And so after Jerry died, of course I'm thinking, yeah, I'm just going to see 1111 all the time and Jerry's going to, you know, let me know he's near and, well, guess what? I wasn't seeing them. And I thought, well, that's really strange. Well, I began to see 333. I'd be, I, I would awaken in the middle of the night and see 333. I didn't really, it didn't, you know, make the connection with me right away. I said, no, you know, my logical mind, no. I, I said to myself, I want 11-11. Well, actually, <laughs> the 11 is are back because, you know, we're always trying to put our logical mind into everything initially. I'm like, no. But now I've opened up to this new vibration of the 333s, and I know that I am being divinely guided by them and, and it means that I have strength and means that we're protected. So numbers are just another, another avenue that we can tap into. And people, everyone has their own, their own signs. It may not be numbers. It may be, may be an animal. It may, be, it may be a color. It may be a sound. It doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. But when you begin to become aware of these, you'll see that these occurrences happen, and they are from the non-physical, the ascended masters, the higher beings that are always mm -hmm. existing around. And and the three connections. So it's so apropos to to my life and and with, and with the numbers because I had written that book three years prior, and it just for some reason I didn't pursue the publishing. Well, now I know the reason. And this is kind of how our journeys in life go. We don't understand why things happen the way they happen and when they happen. But when you live with a sense of inner peace, I say, you know, you, you begin to trust. You trust the universe. You trust that things are going to work out for you. You may not feel it. You may not see it in the moment. But that's where you begin to, you, you, you hang on to your belief system. And, and that's what helped me on my trans, when I had my, you know, epiphany, I realized that my beliefs were, were just holding me back and, and keeping me stuck. And so through all these years, I've realized, well, what, what do I need to, to, to get this inner peace or have this inner peace? And I realized what I was always grasping to throughout my journey, throughout my journey in life and through, especially through my grief, 
I was grasping, wanting, desiring a connection to source, a connection to self, myself, and a connection to soul. Souls are other, other people. And even Maslow, you know, the, the, the psychologist talks about the hierarchical need, and it's number three after, after food and shelter. It's number three. It's love and connectedness. So we, we totally need this. But we need all three, and it's, it's just mind, body, spirit. You know, the life cycle, everything is in, in threes. So we need all three. We, we sometimes think, well, oh, I can get by. But we can't. We need to encompass all of these into our life. And so when I began to write about source, I realized that there's some people that, you know, they're not going to maybe resonate with it. They're not going to understand it or make a connection with it. So... I try to make people think about it in a new way, and I write my books very succinctly. You know, they don't have to be very difficult. I like to make them into very digestible pieces that you can take in. They're very simple, and I've had the simplest books change my life. A couple of them I can name, Thich Nhat Hanh, Peace mm -hmm. is Everything. Very short book, Help Change My Life. Another book I read by James Allen, written in 1908, As a Man Thinketh. And another one by uh, Florence Scola Shin. Uh, I forgot the title of that right now. But anyway, the point is... is no, I, short yeah, and I read recently, yeah, Viktor Frankl's book, oh, yes. Search for Meaning. Oh, that, and it's not a big yes. book. And he wrote it in nine days. Uh, your book, mm -hmm. I just love the threes here because, um, you, you know, and it's easy to grasp too because my book would had threes and my books were on trust. <laughs> so, hey, okay, okay. So that's, so that's right. the, the connection, the three. Yeah. And, and the, it's a connection, three. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. Absolutely. So tell me, and can you tell the, tell, this, tell the group, the audience again, the three, the three I have to ask you, I'm really curious, did you have the name three, three years ago? I did, but I didn't know if I wanted to call it the three S's because it is connection to source, connection to self, and connection to soul. And I didn't know if I was going to call it just the three S's or the S's of, it was, I was really, you know, vacillating about the title. And so the title came to me and I, and I said it, it needs to be the must-have connections. It could have been three connections, but I really wanted to emphasize the must-have because sometimes people that are very spiritual and, you know, they, they're very connected to source, sometimes they can get so far into that space that they're forgetting to connect to soul, to others, to mm -hmm. other human beings, and, and, and you can only live in, in this way for so long because we have to have that connection. And I like to say that everyone we meet on our journey, every encounter is a holy encounter. It may not seem or feel it to, to you at that moment, but I believe that every person that comes into our life it's for a reason. And if we are all created by a source energy, a, a divinity, we are all part of that. We are all one. And I like to make an analogy. It, it's just as, as the waves are not the ocean, but they are part of the ocean. The waves cannot exist without the ocean. So we need each other. We all need each other because we are part of this one. And even in a circle, okay, the, the, like you, you, you use the metaphor for the circle. So the circle, you think of it, the, the outside, it's got the rim. Okay, that circle is the whole entire creation. 
whole entity. And in that circle are all of us, or everything else. And they all have to touch within the circle. Every little cell within that circle is all touching. It's all connected. So we are part of this one. And so if we ignore that, if we ignore that aspect of our, our self and how are we created, then we're kind of missing out. So it's really important to, you know, have connections with other, other people. So that's why I say that is one of the things that will begin to bring you some inner peace. And people, mm-hmm. other souls, they come to you when you need them. And, and we are there for others. It's, it's, about, it's about love. I mean, we are able to give love to other people and we receive love from other people. And actually that is uh, one of the big steps in grief recovery because oftentimes when someone is suffering in grief and they just lost someone or especially suicide, I mean, I, I, most of my clients are, are those who have, have, you know, endured a loss by suicide. And one of the things they often feel is they don't feel lovable. And it, a lot of times it's because of guilt. We think that we should have stopped it. We think we could have done something differently. And so we take that guilt and that just permeates within us. And therefore, it, it's this negative energy and we can't feel love for ourselves and so therefore it's hard to even receive love and people Mm -hmm. are out there and they want to help they want to help you but so you have to begin to open up and 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 I know you talk about the heart so much and so yes it's true you need to open up your heart and allow others to love you so when you're grieving you need you need people to love you. You need that love to come in because you feel that if you lost your, your spouse, if you lost a child, if you lost anyone, you just feel that that love is gone and is taken from you and that, that emptiness. And so, therefore, you need to have people love you. And it's, it's a hard concept for, for many who, who have never learn the, the, the art of self-love and self-care, and then that goes back to the connection to self. That's the second mm-hmm. connection that I talk about. You have to and that's, learn. Sorry, keep going. Go I'll, I'll interrupt you after this. Well, that's around your belief systems that you talk about in the very beginning. Um, and and you're totally flowing right now. I mean, this is such a big topic, Uh you're probably going to come back, Robin, to the show. <laughs> There's, this is a big topic. When you talk about the shame, the guilt, the blame, those are lower, I call them lower vibrations, a little, they're denser. Mm-hmm. I'm curious, do you work with your clients, and I can hear you talking about around, and it's in your book, Forgiveness? Yes. To leverage Absolutely. and shift that. And then, yeah, yeah, and then now we're going into the heart space, and now we're opening up the heart space, and we're going to heal self, heal self with others. Okay. So, yeah, th- this work is so important, and we need the world to mo- shift, to learn to shift, to recognize the shame, blame, and guilt, no matter what's going on, especially when it's around a death, um, yeah. to, to do this love, this love work. And it sounds, it's not corny. <laughs> this is so important. No. And that's what... That's what I say initially to, like I said, I have, and it's so interesting because I started my, my coaching business 10 years after Steve died. That's when I realized that, yes, okay, I want to help other people because I know that it is possible to love life after loss. That became my hashtag. That became my tagline yes you can learn to love your life you don't feel like that in the beginning of course not you just feel like your whole world has ended but you can and 
that part of it is you do have to begin to change your thinking because a lot of the beliefs that we have carried around in us, they keep us stuck. And we don't even know that half the time we are operating on this autopilot mode. (laughs) And we just do these things automatically without even a conscious acknowledgement of them. And so we have to begin to be able to understand that that is happening, and then we can be able to shift and begin to retrain our minds again. And this Mm is something that we begin to do as we begin to heal and to process, because you have to go through the processing of the grief, you know, first. And the important thing is seeking help, so you, you find something, you find a tool. We, throughout our life, we have created a toolbox of things that we turn to that, that, mm-hmm. that help us in our times of grief. But this is what happens when we hit that moment where we are in the dark night of the soul. Guess what? That is when every tool in your box no longer works. And then you reach out to something higher, something greater than yourself because you realize that it's that little self of you that's not enough. It's something bigger that is going to sustain you and keep you going. And that's basically the night of the soul. You, you realize, wow, I want to end my life, but wait a minute, there's something that's going to keep me from it, something that's going to give me hope. And that's what we want to instill in people that are grieving, that there is hope. And that's what I do. And, and, I, and I can do it, I can do it authentically because I've been there. I've been trained oh. as a suicide facilitator for meetings because I've been there. I've been trained. And, and, that's, and it's about a message of authenticity, so, yeah, we're going to segue into that, Robin. We've got five minutes. So can you tell people how they can reach you and about your other two books? Um, oh, yes. In five minutes, I, like how, yeah. Okay, wow. Yeah, it goes by fast. So I did write my first book. It's called Be Gentle With Me, I'm Grieving. And it was after the suicide of Steve. And then I wrote my second book, Moving to Excellence, A Pathway to Transformation After Grief. It is a 10-step approach that you can learn on how to really love and live your life. It's 10 simple steps that, that we oftentimes do, but we're not even aware of them. And I also teach how you really can tap into how you can begin to change your thoughts and reframe your brain through your senses. So that is in Moving to Excellence book. And then the third book, as we've been speaking about, is The Three Must-Have Connections for Inner Peace. And you can reach me on my website, www.robinchodak.com. I'm not doing any grief coaching at the moment because I'm focusing on this book. I started a grief certification program, but that is put on hold at the moment, but I do hope to have that out. So that is where people that are interested in becoming a grief coach, such as myself, you will take my course and you will become certified. So that is something I see happening in the near future. So that's where I am, Andrea. That's awesome. Thank you. And I do know that you're also an Amazon bestseller, so just for people to know oh, that. Yes. Oh, yeah. yes. Thank you for that. I forgot about that. Thank you so much. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, so I'm going to do another quote here from Rene Beatty. Um, Switch your mentality from I'm broken and helpless to I'm growing and healing, and watch how fast your life changes for the better. You are mm-hmm. so loved. I, I think this is big, especially, you know, it's not just COVID. Um, we have like a few minutes. It's not just COVID is big and people can't be with their loved ones often in the hospital to have that, you know, 
um, saying goodbye. I also know the suicide rates are higher, and they're gonna. That's being tracked. So uh, it's very hard. It's a hard time, and you know, again, the most, the only, only certain thing is that we will die. That is, mm -hmm. that's the, that is a fact. So what do you do with your life that you have now? Yes, yes, that's the, that is the question, and that, yes. And that's basically how I live. Okay, how am I going to live? Am I going to live stuck in my life? Or am I going to live it and honor Jerry? And I honor mm. Jerry by living and loving life because he was a wonderful example of how mm. he embraced life. He loved life. He did his service. He was a wonderful doctor. He cared for patients. And in his retirement, he... he, he he sucked as much out of life as he could with all the things that he loved to do. And, and I know that he would want me to be loving my life and embracing it as much as I possibly can. And, and that's what, you know, I, I do in each and every moment. I wake up and I say, thank you, God. I say, thank you, Jerry, for, for giving me a wonderful life. Thank you for your presence always with me because I know he's always around me. And we just continue on. We just take one step at a time. And in the beginning, those steps are short. They're slow. They're a little weakened. But you know what? You just keep taking them. And as you move on, they get stronger and stronger, and your strides get bigger and bigger, and you feel yep. better and better. Mm -hmm. And that's how we're going to end this show. Thank you so much, Robin. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.